Hello, welcome to the Cambridge Festival. I'm Helen Scales and I'm here in the Zoology Museum surrounded by a collection of amazing animals from all across the planet. And I'm here to talk to you about the single biggest living space that we have on this planet that we call home. It's a place that not many of us are ever going to get to see, but it's full of incredible living wonders. And this place is the deep sea. Now, not so long ago, people generally thought that the deep sea was nothing but a massive, empty, endless void, that nothing could live down there. Below the first few hundred metres, it's too cold, too dark, the pressure is far too high, and there's just not enough food for anything to survive. But of course, we now know that is not the case, and that things live in the ocean all the way to the bottom. We currently live in a golden age of scientific discovery in the deep sea. We've got amazing cutting edge technologies that are opening up new views of the deep, which we've never seen before. We're finding out more about what lives in the deep, how organisms thrive and survive in these extreme conditions. And we're also learning what life in the deep has to tell us and what it means for the rest of life on Earth. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. First of all, though, I think we should get to grips with the immense scale and size of the deep sea. Now, if I were to climb on board a nice sailing ship, perhaps a nice yacht, and sail off uh, into the ocean, across the waves, to a place above a really deep part of the ocean. And if I was to take a normal glass marble and drop it over the side of the ship, it would take a really long time for it to get to the bottom of the sea. Now, the average depth of the oceans is around about four kilometres. And for my marble to reach that depth would take about two hours. For the first few minutes, it would pass through the sunlit zone, that familiar surface part of the ocean that we know so well, where so much lives. And then at around 200 meters, it would reach the twilight zone. Now, the sunlight there is really starting to run out. All we've got is a very dim blue light. It looks like twilight at night when you would just step outside and see that lovely blue color in the sky. Same kind of thing happens in the ocean. And the marble would take about half an hour to pass through the twilight zone uh, down to 1,000 meters when it enters the permanent dark of the midnight zone where there's no sunlight at all. And my marble would keep on falling down. As that marble falls down through those zones, it passes life everywhere it is in the deep sea. It will pass things like Dumbo octopus, flying through the open water with flaps of things on the sides of their body, which look a bit like ears, but they're not. It will pass amazing creatures that can make their own light. There's no sunlight, but there is light in the deep sea. Around three quarters of the organisms living in these open waters can make their own light. They're bioluminescent. It's a really useful thing to be able to do if you live somewhere that's permanently dark. And a lot of these bioluminescent animals are made of delicate jelly. We see these incredible life forms that we just don't find anywhere else on the planet. Now, if my aim is good and I happen to be over a part of the ocean which goes even deeper than that average depth of four kilometers, my marble might just end up in an oceanic trench. And those are the deepest parts of our ocean. They go down to just shy of 11,000 meters. And to go all the way to the deepest part of our ocean, it's gonna take my marble six and a half hours. And when it reaches the bottom, the pressure on it is going to be immense. I think it's going to be all right, though, because it's a sphere and it's made of glass. The pressure's going to be equal coming in on all sides of it. But it's going to be equivalent uh, to around a thousand times atmospheric pressure or um, an African elephant standing on every square inch of anything that is existing uh, down there in the deepest parts of the ocean. But there's life down there, too. Would you believe it? There is life in the bottom of these oceanic trenches. Here's some footage of some snailfish, the deepest dwelling vertebrates, the most pressure proof fish that we have in the oceans. And they have been found living down in these incredibly deep ocean trenches. 
This footage was shot in the Mariana Trench, the deepest ocean trench, in July 2020. Not quite at the bottom, but at a pretty impressive 7,037 metres. As well as being tremendously deep, the deep ocean also covers a huge portion of our planet. Waters deeper than 200 metres make up around half of the surface area of the planet. So if we take that surface and the depth into account, we really do have an enormous volume of water. In fact, it's around about a billion cubic kilometres, if you can try and imagine something quite so large as that. To put it in context, the Amazon River, the biggest river that we have, puts out a single cubic kilometre of water every 80 minutes. So we emptied the oceans and we just had the Amazon pouring in to fill up the deep sea up to that 200 metre mark. Um, it would take the Amazon River 150,000 years to fill up the deep sea. That's just how huge it is. So there's no doubt at all that the deep ocean is the single biggest living space on the planet. And a major challenge of living there is finding enough food to eat, because the deep is a very hungry place. The twilight zone from 200 metres down has a little bit of sunlight, but it's not enough to power photosynthesis. So there's no new food being made by plants or algae or microbes. Just as we have out here on land and in shallow seas, that's where our food comes from. It comes from those plants and algae that feed into the bottom of the food web. But we don't have that in the deep sea. What instead a lot of organisms living there rely on are bits of dead stuff falling down from above. We call it marine snow, and it does look like it's snowing uh, in the ocean, down in the deep. These white fluffy particles are constantly raining down. It sounds nice, but it's, uh, it's actually not as lovely as you might imagine. This marine snow is made up mostly of dead plankton, tiny plants and algae, uh, tiny animals, the zooplankton, as well as their poo. And it's all stuck together in clumps uh, with this sticky stuff that um, aquatic microbes make and they form these flakes of snow which rain down into the deep. And this is a really important source of food for deep sea organisms. And there are all sorts of creatures that have evolved different ways living in the open ocean of catching that snow. They're snow catchers. Things like this vampire squid, the vampire squid from hell, Vampyrotuthus infernalis. It sounds really terrifying. It looks pretty scary too. But in fact, it's a very gentle snow catching creature. It's a fairly small cephalopod, so around about uh, 30 centimetres long. They live down in the deep sea and they have this long thin filament which they stretch out several times their body length, which they basically just lay out in the water and wait for bits of marine snow to come and settle onto that. And then every now and then they reel in that filament and then scrape the particles of marine snow up together into, into snowballs, which they then pass uh, up into their mouth and then they eat them. So these are really quite gentle creatures. Now, vampire squid are not, in fact, true squid, as biologists know them. There are lots of lovely squid specimens here in the museum, and they are true squid, but the vampires are the single known member of their own ancient order of cephalopods, the vampyromorpha. As well as the animals that grab snow as it's falling down through the water column, others find piles of snow that have fallen down on the seabed in the abyss, including things like sea cucumbers. Now, these are quite familiar creatures from shallow seas. Perhaps if you've been snorkeling near a coral reef, you might have seen them lolling around on the seabed, looking like enormous sausages, not the most exciting creatures to see. Um, although there are some that have little fish that live uh, inside their bums, um, which is kind of interesting, a special safe place for those fish to live. Down in the deep, sea cucumbers actually are a bit more exciting and a bit more active. And there are some that will occasionally swim through the open water. This creature is the headless chicken monster. Well, that's uh, the nickname that it's uh, picked up. Its real name, scientifically, is a Nipneastes. And these are one of these part-time swimming sea cucumbers. They will crawl across the seabed looking for piles of marine snow to eat, but now and then they will launch themselves up into the water and drift along with undulations of this frilly part of their body which help them to move. And uh, we think this could be um, an escape response, possibly, if they get scared by some kind of predator. But it may also be for them to go and find new flurries of marine snow and find really good tasty bits of uh, the seabed to start munching. 
it really is important to try and find as much of this stuff as possible. Only around 2% of the food that's made in the shallow seas makes it down uh, to the deep sea in the form of marine snow. So there's not a lot to go around, um, and it really will help if an organism like a sea cucumber can find as much marine snow as it can. So that's one way that organisms in the deep survive, by basically scavenging the bits that fall from above and this, these fine particles of marine snow. But there are also some bigger things which will end up down in the deep. And some organisms in the deep sea have evolved really specialised diets, and that's how they survive down there, by only eating one certain type of food that ends up occasionally falling down into the deep. So there are whole ecosystems, species and ecosystems that specialise in things like chunks of dead wood, would you believe? All the way down in the abyss, occasionally you'll find chunks of wood, trees, branches will sweep out to sea after storms and such like, and the salt water will invade that wood and eventually it'll get waterlogged and sink. And that's a big store of carbon that ends up down in the deep sea and there are organisms that make the most of it. There are other deep sea creatures that will eat only things like dead whales, another enormous source of food that now and then ends up landing down in the deep. And there are even other ones that will favour a diet of other giant vertebrates. This is a Nile crocodile here in the museum, which doesn't just live in the Nile River, but in swamps and rivers and marshlands all across the African continent. So they could end up getting swept out to sea and sinking into the deep now and then. This elegant skull is a gharial, which are sadly now critically endangered, but there used to be lots more of them in rivers all across the Indian subcontinent. So maybe in the past, some of their remains may also have swept out into the ocean and into the deep sea. I recently went to the Gulf of Mexico and joined a deep sea research expedition. And one of the things we did was something that deep sea biologists had never done before. We took three dead American alligators and we put them in the abyss. And we did that because we wanted to know what would eat them. So here's a picture of me with that alligator. Ours were American alligators, which used to be quite endangered, but conservation measures across the southern United States mean they're actually doing pretty well now. And we obtained ours by special permit from a humane culling program. And that's how it happened that we were sailing off into the Gulf of Mexico with three dead alligators packed into the freezers amongst all the food that we we're going to eat for the next two weeks. We didn't just throw our alligators off the side of the ship, they would have been quite hard to find again, but we lowered them down in a metal cage called a benthic elevator, basically a deep sea elevator. You lower them down on the end of a very long cable, down two kilometres to the abyss below us. And we used a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, which are one of the amazing cutting edge tools that we have as deep sea biologists to look and study in the deep. Now, there aren't people on board these. They're remotely operated by a pilot up on the ship at the surface. And there's a great big long cable which sends down instructions and beams back up high definition live video feed from the deep. And they also have robotic arms so these machines can pick things up and put things back down. So we use that to carefully pick up our dead alligators and lay them down in the abyss. And then we left them and came back later to see what happened. Now, our first alligator we looked at after 24 hours, and that was all the time it took for something incredible to unfold down in the deep. Because as the camera panned in on our remote operated vehicle, we saw that this alligator was already being feasted on by dozens of giant isopods. Now, isopods are relatives of wood lice that you might find in your garden. They're little creatures that roll up in a ball when they get scared. Only these ones are massive. They grow to about the size of a rugby ball. We've got some here in the museum, which are a little bit smaller than that, but you get the idea of what these guys look like. And they are scavengers. And the reason for that enormous body size is essentially to build up enormous reserves of food. They're basically full of fat. And that keeps them going for ages. So after feasting on an alligator or something else big in the deep like this, they won't have to feed again for a few years. <laughs> 
It's an example of what we call deep sea gigantism, which you see quite a lot in the deep sea. Lots of other creatures that grow enormously big down at these great depths. Things like this giant spider crab, which is a brilliantly enormous creature indeed. So that was alligator number one. Our second alligator we came back to after a month, and by that point it had been stripped completely clean to this beautiful, elegant skeleton just lying there on the abyss where we'd left it. And as our camera panned in closer, the exciting thing we saw was that it looked like those bones of that alligator were covered in red shaggy carpet. And we were very excited about this because it meant that those bones had been infested by bone-eating worms. Now, these are creatures that were first discovered on dead whales, on whale skeletons, in 2002. Some scientists accidentally bumped into a dead whale down in the abyss while they were doing other work, as you do. And they found these very strange-looking creatures. They brought uh, these pink things back up to the surface, and they're so odd, it took them quite a while to figure out that they are actually types of polychaete worms. You find polychaetes all through coastal seas. There's lots of different ones we see here in the museum, things like lugworms and sandworms. But these polychaetes from these bones of animals down in the deep were completely different. And for a long time, it took scientists really a while to puzzle over what they are, because they are not really anything like the polychaetes we see up in the shallows. I've drawn you a lovely picture of a bone-eating worm. Hopefully you can appreciate my brilliant artistic skills. <laughs> but it gives you the idea of the basic uh, anatomy of one of these weird creatures. Um, this uh, at the top is the red gill that sticks out at the top of this uh, tube which they live inside, a sticky mucus tube. And then this is where it gets really interesting, down at the bottom, this green root, uh, which makes them look a bit more like a plant. And it was definitely one of the bits of this uh, worm that got people, the scientists, scratching their heads as to what was going on. But this is really cool. Basically what happens is this root secretes acid and it allows these worms to burrow holes into the bones of these vertebrates, into whales and alligators. And then once the, uh, the worm is inside, this root has penetrated into the bones, there are microbes living inside uh, these roots which secrete an enzyme which helps those worms digest collagen, the tough protein inside of bones, which is a really difficult thing to eat. But with all of these things going on in the root, it means these bone-eating worms can actually make a living and they can survive just eating bones and nothing else. Now, uh, when they were first discovered, they got picked up uh, by the press and given a new nickname, which is the zombie uh, worms, which doesn't quite make sense because I think zombies are supposed to eat brains, not bones. But anyway, um, the zombie worms were born and that's what they were remembered as. Scientifically, we call them osidax from the Latin words os meaning bone and edax meaning devourer because these things definitely do eat bones. And the cool thing about the alligator that we put down in the Gulf of Mexico was that when we brought back specimens of those bones with those pink wiggly things sticking out of them, um, we sent them off to the specialists who know what they're doing with these things, and they found two new species of bone-eating worms. The first that had ever been found in the Gulf of Mexico and the first ever to be found on a reptile. So it was pretty cool and, and basically shows that the deep sea partly because it is just so enormous and there's still so much left to discover that all you have to do is put a dead alligator in the abyss and you find new species just like that. So those were our two alligators we put in the abyss and there was a third one as well and the story of this one is a little different. Now we went back to look for it about eight days after we put it in the abyss but it was nowhere to be seen. It had completely vanished. We found the right spot. We found the place on the seabed where we left it. There was a depression and the marker we'd left with this alligator to help us find it, but it wasn't there. All we could see was a drag mark in the abyss, scraping away across the sediment into the dark. So of course we followed that pathway to see what might lie at the end of it. And did we find the alligator? We did not. All we found was the weight that we had tied to it, 18 kilos, and a thick rope that was tying the alligator to that weight was cleanly bitten through. Something very big had come along and eaten our alligator. 
So there's a couple of possibilities for our alligator grabbing predator. One is the Greenland shark. They don't just live up in Greenland, you can sometimes find them in the Gulf of Mexico. And these things are big enough and their jaws are strong enough that they could possibly have abducted our alligator. Another possibility is a six gill shark. Most sharks have five gills, these guys have six, and they're also really big. So that's another possibility. But there is one more story that could have been the end of our alligator that we left, our alligator number three. At around the same time that we were doing this study, another team of scientists, not so far away in the Gulf, were looking for some other predators down in the deep ocean waters. They put down remote cameras and were filming hours and hours of footage looking for these things. And then eventually they saw what they were looking for. A big, long tentacle reached out uh, from the dark and grabbed at the camera, covered in suckers, a creature at least three meters long. So, it's possible, but we will never know for sure, but it's possible that our third alligator was grabbed and taken away by that very same giant squid. And that's pretty exciting. So, three alligators, three different fates in the deep, and three glimpses of how animals survive in this hungry space and find different things to eat. Now, we don't have a giant squid here in the Cambridge Zoology Museum. You're going to have to go to London for that one. Um, but we do have some other cool uh, sharks. Not a Greenland shark, but we have a goblin shark here um, with these very strange-looking jaws. Goblin shark jaws are attached to elastic ligaments, which let them swing open to an enormous wide gape of 111 degrees, and they fling them forwards at 3.1 meters per second, reaching almost a tenth of their body length. And that means that they can grab hapless prey before it has a chance to escape. Now, if humans could do the same trick, it would mean we could snap a chocolate bar dangling a hand span in front of our mouths. A pretty amazing feat. Goblin sharks live in the deep sea around sea mounts, enormous underwater volcanoes, some of them active, some of them inactive, and there are loads of them across the deep sea. We think at least 100,000 enormous sunken mountains are down in the deep, with a height of at least 1,500 metres above the seabed, but their peaks don't actually rise above the surface. And there are even more of the smaller sea mounts, peaks of about 100 metres or more. There could be 25 million of these things through the deep sea and they create this enormous fragmented habitat, bigger than all of the world's rainforests put together. And seamounts also have some amazing things living on them, and a forest built not of plants, but of animals. Corals are best known from shallow tropical seas, like these beautiful exhibits here at the museum. But in fact, corals can live in the deep as well. Of the 5,000 known species we have, at least half of them are known to live in deep waters, and they can get down to 8,000 metres. And down in the deep, corals are just as beautiful as the ones we see in the shallows, growing in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colours. A key difference between the corals living down in the deep and up in the shallows is that there's no sunlight down in the deep. On a coral reef like the Great Barrier Reef, the corals there have algae in their tissues which help them to feed. Now these are harnessing the sun's energy through photosynthesis and providing food as sugars, but they don't have any of that down in the deep, so corals are on their own and they basically have to catch food from the water. Particles of marine snow, they use these beautiful tiny flower-like polyps to grab bits of food from the water, things like zooplankton and uh, particles of marine snow, whatever's coming along. Corals live beside a whole bunch of other animals that need a hard surface to grow on. Things like this sea lily, which is a relative of uh, starfish and sea cucumbers, but they only are found down in the deep. Seamounts also have sponges growing on them, which come in all sorts of bizarre shapes. Scientists recently explored a seamount in the Pacific with odd-looking corals and sponges growing all over it, which they named the Forest of the Weird. They all face in the same direction, as you can see here, because they're intercepting the prevailing currents and picking up particles of food wafting by. These animal-made forests make a really important habitat for other animals as well to live in. Things like squat lobsters, sharks will come along and lay their eggs in the branches of bushy-like corals, and all sorts of other animals come here to feed and hide away. <laughs> 
And similar to ancient old growth forests out on land, these animal forests that grow on seamounts live for a very long time. And in fact, sponges and corals down in the deep are some of the oldest known things that we have found on the planet. These bamboo corals live for 200 years. Gold corals can live for a thousand years. And oldest of all, and we've got some here in the museum, which is very exciting, are black corals. Radioisotope studies of their skeletons show that individual colonies have been alive for as long as 4,200 years. And they started growing during the Bronze Age, a time when the pharaohs of ancient Egypt were building their great pyramids. In the contest for the longest lived things on the planet, corals are cheating a little bit. They aren't individual animals that live for all of this time, but colonies of polyps that split apart and grow on the same skeleton. So they have been growing there in the same places for thousands of years, and that's pretty cool. But we find loads of other really old things in the deep sea as well. Greenland sharks, those creatures that maybe took one of our alligators in the Gulf of Mexico, they can live for 500 years, the oldest lived vertebrates on the planet. And there are clams living in the deep sea, ocean quahogs, which also live for 500 years. And we genuinely see this trend, actually, as you're going down into the deep of older and older things and things that live for longer. And we're not quite sure why this is, but it's probably something to do with the combined conditions, this extreme place in the deep of the dark, the cold, the lack of food, which means that life generally is very slow. Rather than living fast and dying young, organisms in the deep tend to take their time, waiting for the next meal to come along, and for the next mate to come along. So we do see lots of very old things down in the deep. And corals, as well as being very old, help us to understand what the oceans used to be like. Scientists have worked out how to extract chemicals from specific parts of that coral skeleton as it was growing, and they can work out what the temperature was like when it was growing thousands of years ago, what the nutrients were like, what the pH was like. And in this way, we can build up a picture of how the oceans used to be and help to understand what might change in the future as well. So deep sea corals are very useful for us understanding the oceans. And they help us in another way too. They tell us a story about how species get into the deep sea in the first place. Lacy corals, known as stylasterids, are a group that mostly live down in the deep. There are hundreds of species and about 90% of them only live in the deep sea. And in fact, we know from fossils that they first evolved down there around 65 million years ago, around the time the dinosaurs were going extinct. These guys were getting going down in the deep and speciating into loads of different species. And then genetic studies have shown us that in fact on four separate occasions over the course of about 40 million years, some of those lace corals came up into the shallows and they actually occupied those shallow waters and you can find them on reefs in shallow waters today. And this goes against a story that we generally assume is happening in the deep sea, which is that species come from the shallow waters and sink down into those extreme depths and figure out how to survive down there. These lace corals show us that it can happen in the other direction too, and that deep corals and deep species do occasionally come back up to the surface and contribute to that biodiversity in the shallower parts of our oceans. So we've heard about how animals in the deep will eat whatever comes their way. Particles of marine snow falling down, the occasional alligator landing in the abyss. But there's another way that organisms in the deep find a way to feed themselves. And when it was first discovered 40 years ago, it revolutionized the view of life on Earth. Scientists went diving inside the submersible Alvin, not too far from the Galapagos Islands, and they were looking at structures that we call hydrothermal vents or black smokers. And when they peered out of the window, these were geologists. They were just expecting to see something interesting happening in terms of the, uh, the heat and the rocks at the bottom of the sea. But what they saw was a complete surprise because they saw that these hydrothermal vents were covered in extraordinary life. in giant tube worms, enormous clams the size of dinner plates. This was a whole ecosystem that no one had ever known about hiding down in the dark. 
It took a couple of years for scientists to work out what was going on here and how these organisms were feeding themselves and how they could be so abundant. And the secret that they found out was all to do with stuff that comes pouring out of these black smokers. Now, hydrothermal vents form at different parts of the ocean, in places where tectonic plates are either crashing together or pulling apart. And what you need for a hydrothermal vent to form is a chamber of molten magma, not too far down in the seabed. Because what happens is that seawater will trickle down through cracks in the seabed and come close to these magma chambers. It will heat up and start changing, rather than just being normal seawater, into hydrothermal fluid. It becomes incredibly hot, it picks up all sorts of dissolved chemicals and metals from the surrounding rocks. The fluids then gush back up through the seabed in the deep sea equivalent of hot springs on land, only much, much hotter. Vents can be several hundred degrees Celsius, and all it is is the pressure stopping those enormously hot fluids from boiling and turning into gas. But down in the deep sea, fluids can be at much higher temperatures without actually boiling. And as those fluids collide with the cold seawater, a lot of the dissolved metals and minerals in those fluids deposit out and form these great big tall towering chimneys, these hydrothermal vent chimneys, which can be tens of meters tall. And these scorching fluids are pouring out of these chimneys. There's very little oxygen in that water. There are all of these toxic chemicals, things like methane and sulfide. And I think I already mentioned it's pretty hot down there. So these are not the sorts of places you would expect to see abundant life. Not a very hospitable place for things to live. And yet, as scientists are discovering, every time they go and visit a hydrothermal vent, they can be absolutely swarming with life. This is a vent in the Southern Ocean, near Antarctica, which was explored for the first time in 2010, when scientists found these sprawling congregations of white crabs. I have one of these lovely white crabs here, lent to me by John Copley at to the National Oceanography Centre. And hopefully you can make out that uh, one of the kind of unusual things about these guys is that they have hairy chests. And in fact, uh, the nickname for these crabs is the Hoff Crab. The scientists decided to name it after David Hasselhoff in honour of his character in the TV series Baywatch, who spent a lot of time running around uh, as a lifeguard in Los Angeles wearing a pair of red shorts and showing off his hairy chest. And the hairy chest on these crabs really is important because that's how these things survive, down on hydrothermal vents. Growing among those hairs are thick colonies of bacteria. And these aren't just any old bacteria, but they carry out a process called chemosynthesis, which is a dark alternative to photosynthesis. Now, this process was first discovered when hydrothermal vents were first seen and these amazing ecosystems found in the 1970s. And up until then, it was assumed that the only source of energy for life on Earth came from the sun, which powers photosynthesis in plants and algae, providing all that food that the rest of us rely on. But here was an ecosystem entirely cut off from the sun and powered not by sunlight, but by the energy in chemicals. And the bacteria living in all sorts of places on vents, including in the chests of hoff crabs, are powered by chemicals like methane and hydrogen sulfide. They use those chemicals to create energy, which they use themselves, these bacteria, to grow, and also to generate sugars. And it's that food that organisms like hoff crabs then eat. Loads of animals on vents, including giant tube worms and mussels and clams, all have chemosynthetic microbes actually living inside them, often in specialized tissues and organs. Giant tube worms have a thing called a trophosome, which is this great big long pouch which fills up a huge part of their body. These worms themselves can be about three meters long. And this trophosome is packed with uh, microbes that are using these chemicals, these chemosynthetic microbes are creating food. And there's masses of them. Just a teaspoon of that tissue from the trophosome has something like 100 billion bacteria inside of it. And that's providing all the food that that worm needs to eat. And the worm itself is doing everything it needs to look after those microbes. It's a symbiotic relationship. So those red tentacles sticking out of the worm, they're providing all the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen sulfide that those bacteria need to survive. And the bacteria are quite happy living inside, giving up some of their food to the worm, but basically living a nice, safe life inside them.
For things like the hoff crab, these uh, bacteria are living on the outside of their bodies, and that's still how they get their food. These crabs have special comb-like structures on some of their arms, which they basically use to comb their chest hairs. There are other relatives of hoff crabs, which we call yeti crabs, which have hairy, long arms. They look a bit like abominable snowmen. And they have bacteria growing in their arms, and then they comb out that lovely colonies of chemosynthetic bacteria and eat them, and that's how they get their food. And that's how we see basically so much life thriving at hydrothermal vents, all powered by this chemosynthetic energy. There are at least 700 species of animals living on hydrothermal vents, and eight out of 10 of them are endemic, and they don't live anywhere else on the planet. It's not just finding food that's a big challenge for things living on hydrothermal vents. It's also pretty hot, as I've already mentioned. Pompeii worms are one of the most heat-proof organisms that have been found on the planet. They actually live um, in tubes stuck to the side of vent chimneys. And uh, measurements inside those tubes have come up with temperatures of around 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. And somehow these uh, worms are able to survive these pretty hot temperatures. The genetics of these Pompeii worms show us some of the secrets of how they survive on these hydrothermal vents. They create things called heat shock proteins, which help to protect their vital molecules and stop them from unraveling in this immense heat. They also have a particular form of collagen, which is incredibly pressure resistant, so that helps them to survive all this way down, miles beneath the waves. They also have a particular form of haemoglobin, a very efficient form of this blood molecule which picks up oxygen and delivers it around the body, which means they can survive in these low oxygen areas on hydrothermal vents. And as well as the heat, hydrothermal vents are very toxic places to live. And this is something else that organisms living on vents have figured out a way to survive. This is a scaly foot snail discovered on a vent in the Southwest Indian Ocean. And as you can see from this picture, it's got a very strange looking foot covered in overlapping scales. Now those scales, as well as the black shiny shell, are made of iron. And they're the only animal we know of that has an exoskeleton made from an iron-based compound. When these were first discovered, it was generally thought, and quite rightly so, that those weird iron-based shells and scaly feet protecting the snail from some kind of external threat, maybe from predators that are trying to eat them on the hydrothermal vents. But in fact, the true story about these weird snails is the complete opposite. And these snails in shining armour are in fact protecting themselves from a threat that comes from within. Scientists have examined the structure of these foot scales and found they're made up of thousands of nanoscopic tubes. And they've worked out that these function as tiny exhaust pipes. These snails have bacteria living inside them, chemosynthetic bacteria, which as they're providing food, also release sulfur. And sulfur is toxic to snails. So what happens is that sulfur moves along these tiny exhaust pipes and it reacts with iron dissolved in the seawater that's coming out of the hydrothermal vent and form nanoparticles of iron sulfide, including in the form of shiny fool's gold. So that's how these snails manage to survive on their chemosynthetic diet without poisoning themselves. And engineers are actually quite excited about what this discovery is telling us about how to make nanoparticles of iron and iron compounds. Because at the moment, the industrial processes we have to do that, and apparently nanoparticles are quite useful things to make, but they're only available in very high temperature processes, and so they're very expensive. And now we can see that these snails are doing it at pretty low temperatures. They live in the parts of the vents away from those really scorching chimneys, and they're doing it at about 10 degrees. So maybe we can learn something and get an inspiration from these snails as to how to make those industrial processes even more efficient. So hydrothermal vents are teaching us so much about how life evolves in these extreme depths, but they are also giving us clues as to how life itself may have begun in the first place. A leading theory suggests that living cells first evolved on white smokers, a slightly cooler form of these vents with alkaline fluids pouring through them, not as strongly acidic as those black smokers. And the idea is that pores within this vent could have provided templates for living cells creating the necessary conditions for life-giving reactions to take place. Researchers at UCL have built simulated hydrothermal vents in their labs and recently formed simple proto-cells, which suggests that maybe there is something to this theory of life beginning in hydrothermal vents.
And scientists at NASA are also building mini vents in their labs. And that's because there are vents not just on planet Earth, but elsewhere in this solar system as well. So maybe there's a possibility that life might be out there on other vents too. There are known to be hydrothermal vents on Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa, maybe even on Mars. So perhaps life has evolved in those hydrothermal vents too. We're still learning so much about hydrothermal vents in terms of all the amazing things that live there, but we're also finding really useful stuff there too. We've got those scaly foot snails with their weird feet that could help inspire new engineering processes. And we also already have things like enzymes. TAC polymerases are enzymes that are used in research labs all around the world. And they were originally extracted from a microbe living on one of those super hot hydrothermal vent chimneys. And they're used in all sorts of important genetic research, basically to make millions of copies very quickly of little snippets of DNA. And it's used in all sorts of things from DNA fingerprinting to locating and identifying viruses like the one that causes COVID-19. The Deep offers us loads more inspiration of all sorts of things, including potential new medicines. Bacteria found at the bottom of the deepest trench, the Mariana Trench, have been found to contain compounds that could help to treat different types of cancers. And a really important place that scientists are looking for inspiration for new medicines is inside deep sea corals and sponges. And we're finding incredible novel chemicals inside these animals. In a similar way to plants, which we make many traditional and modern drugs from, corals and sponges can't run away from attackers. So instead they produce potent chemical weapons, so-called secondary metabolites. And down in the deep among all these incredible animals, there are equally as incredible chemicals that they use to deter predators from eating them. They're also covered in microbes, which likewise produce unusual and potent chemicals, including possible new antibiotics. Modern techniques mean that we don't have to go and harvest masses of coral and sponges to collect these interesting and important chemicals for new medicines. All we need are tiny snippets of material. We can use those remote operated vehicles to take small samples. And then back in the lab, we can amplify and extract those chemicals, study what they are and figure out which ones are gonna be most useful. So this kind of scientific research and bio discovery really has a very small impact on deep sea species and ecosystems. But there are other things that humans are doing down in the deep sea which are having much bigger impacts. All sorts of trash is ending up in the deep sea. Plastics are getting into the deep. Of course they are, plastics are everywhere. They're falling down through the open ocean. Plasticized particles of marine snow are being picked up by animals like vampire squid. And they're landing in the abyss, in some places in huge concentrations. The equivalent that on the open pages of a book, 100,000 microplastic specks are landing in the equivalent area of the seabed. So we are unfortunately contaminating the most remote and distant parts of the deep sea with the stuff that we're throwing away out here on land. We're also fishing the deep sea, especially causing a lot of trouble in places like seamounts, catching very long lived species of fish that live around these even older corals and sponges. And deep sea trawling is really causing enormous impacts on these delicate ecosystems. One more impact we could soon see in the deep, which isn't happening yet, but is on the horizon, is deep sea mining. There are companies and countries around the world who want to send down enormous machinery to chop away at the tops of seamounts and to knock down hydrothermal vent chimneys to find the metals that lie within them. And scientists are telling us that if this happens, it is likely to have enormous impacts on the biodiversity of our planet and maybe even the health of the entire planet as well. Scaly foot snails were the first species to be listed recently as endangered because of the threat of deep sea mining. They only live on three hydrothermal vents in an area of habitat that covers the size of about four football pitches. And two of those vents have already been given to mining companies with exploration permits. And those permits could eventually lead to full scale commercial mines. And it's not just snails that will be impacted by deep sea mining. Animals all the way through the deep sea could come into contact with contamination and disturbance stirred up by these mining activities. 
Seabed ores will be pumped up along pipes to the surface, along with a whole lot of seawater, which is going to become contaminated by those crushed ores, releasing heavy metals and all sorts of other toxins. And that seawater is going to be extracted from those ores and pumped back down into the sea as mining tailings. And that could be at around 1,000 metres down in the twilight zone and perhaps down into the midnight zone, an area that is not used to having these particles injected into them, these clouds, these gritty clouds of toxins. And this is where a lot of animals go to feed, animals from the surface, deep diving whales like beaked whales will move down into these areas that could become contaminated by deep sea mining to feed. Amazing animals like leatherback turtles also feed down in the twilight zone, potentially swimming right through this contaminated cloud stirred up by deep sea mining. Delicate jellyfish and other jelly creatures that make their own light in the twilight zone could also find themselves swimming through these toxic clouds and they might not even be able to see their lights anymore because of this pollution stirred up by deep sea mining. Mining companies are telling us that mining the deep seabed is going to solve the climate crisis. We need these metals in order to make solar panels, wind turbines and batteries for electric cars. That's what we're being told. But the truth of the matter is it's a very complex question to work out which specific elements and metals will be needed for those kinds of devices and where they're going to come from. There's nothing telling us that it has to be metals that come from hydrothermal vents or seamounts or from the abyssal plains. There are rocks covering the abyssal plains which are also a target for deep sea mines. These don't necessarily have to be the ones that we're going to use. There are other options too. We can generate much more of a circular economy so that the metals we have are reused and recycled. And the bigger picture is that if we do start mining the deep sea, there's a chance that it will cause much more trouble for the climate crisis than it will ever be able to solve. Because the deep sea is a critically important store of carbon down in the abyss, also locked up in the animals that live down there. And if deep sea mining goes ahead, those carbon stores could be disrupted and it could all get much, much worse. The deep sea is the last vast frontier we have on this planet, but we don't have to open it up and we don't have to keep telling the same story that we've always been telling of exploitation and depletion. We could decide that there are places on this planet that are too important and too special to do that and we could just leave them alone and one of those places is the deep. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the deep. If you would like to know more about the deep sea and the amazing things that live there, why this all matters and the threats to the deep sea, then do check out my new book, The Brilliant Abyss. It's available to Cambridge Festival goers here in the UK at a special discount. So if you want to go and order a copy from my publisher, it's also going to be on sale in North America and hopefully elsewhere in the world as well. So thank you very much for watching. And if you can make it down to Cambridge when times are safer, then do come and check out the museum and all the amazing animals here from the deep sea and elsewhere too. <laughs>